So our next speaker is, is uh, Luis Quintana Mercy from the Pasteur Institute. So Luis has been in Pasteur for 17 years, he told me yesterday, uh, primarily working with uh, human genetics. Uh, he has uh, contributed many key uh, studies to the field of human genetics, uh, the influence of migration, the influence of pathogens, and more recently, interaction with environment and epigenetics. Uh, and he also was uh, recently appointed director scientific of the Pasteur Institute. So the floor is yours now. So thank you very much, Luc, for this kind invitation. So in the next 40 minutes or so, I will share with you some of our most recent results about how uh, humans can adapt to pathogen pressures, and also we'll see how this can also impact on some phenotypes, and I will focus on molecular phenotypes, such as gene expression upon infection, to end with some kind of uh, data of how humans, I wouldn't say they can adapt, but they can respond uh, to pathogen pressures through epigenetic responses. So basically my lab tries to understand the different forces that shape the patterns of diversity of the human genome. So some genomic forces such as mutation or recombination, demographic forces such as populations that are like, under expansion or go through bottlenecks, and how natural selection all, and how all these forces shapes the patterns of diversity between individuals and populations, and then in turn, these patterns of genetic diversity can influence phenotypic diversity both within populations or between different human populations. So in the next 10 years or so, we have been quite focused on understanding how pressures exerted by, exerted by pathogens have um, influenced the variability of the human genome. So the first question is why do we care about pathogens from an evolutionary point of view? As you know, uh, one of the main reasons is that infectious diseases have been a major cause of mortality until yesterday from an evolutionary point of view. Here you can see, for example, that in the UK, what, just 120 years ago, around 38% of the population reached the age of 40. Uh, whereas today, in the UK, 98% of the population reached the age of 40. You can see that infectious diseases keep on being a major cause of mortality. Here in purple, uh, Mozambique, the same year as the UK, that means 2000, just around 50% of the population reached the age of 40. Another thing that we care about is, obviously, immune responses. So why do we care immune responses? Because there's huge amount of variation between healthy individuals here in this room in terms of the way we are going to respond to infection. With all the applications that this may have in terms of how we are going to respond, for example, to vaccine treatment. So as you will see in one of the examples, one thing that we are trying to understand is the genetic, epigenetic and environmental factors that uh, are involved in determining the variation in immune responses that we found in the general population. So all this allows us to evaluate, as you will see in the first example, how selection, natural selection, in its different form and intensities have shaped the, shaped the patterns of diversity of the human genome. We also evaluate uh, genotype by environment interactions in the context of infection. And our ultimate goal is to identify immunological mechanisms under genetic control that have conferred a better adaptation to humans uh, to pathogen pressures. So the first example, I will kind of focus quite quickly on our work on how pathogens have exerted pressure on immunity-related genes. So the relation between natural selection and infectious disease is something quite old. Actually, one of the first examples was in the mid of the 20th century in the 1950s when Anthony, Anthony Allison remarked that people that were heterozygotes for the hemoglobin S were better protected against falciparum malaria. While the price to pay for that is that homozygote individuals develop sickle, sickle cell anemia. This example here is just to show you how what sometimes classically in medical research is considered a bad thing, that means a loss of function mutation, actually losing function sometimes can be good. And here is a mutation that, as you can see here, can reach almost 100% frequency in Central Africa. This mutation um, is a loss of function mutation in this gene, the Duffy antigen receptor chemokine, because people that have lost 
this um, uh, people that has this loss of functional mutation are better protected almost Mende from a Mendelian point of view to vivax malaria. The idea being that this is the reason why vi vi vivax malaria is absent in uh, sub-Saharan sub -Saharan Africa. So basically what my lab is doing is trying to understand the molecular signatures left by each type of natural selection, including the absence of natural selection, that means neutrality, in our genomes. Here you have chromosomes, this is the past, this is the present, and basically here you have the example of purifying selection. You have lots of mutations in blue that are neutral, no effect on fitness and on phenotypes, and then you have mutations that appear here in black that are deleterious for the organism. So purifying selection will tell, tend to remove these mutations from the population. Genes that are under purifying selection are genes that are extremely constrained over evolution, so genes that cannot allow to accumulate functional variation. So these genes are most likely to be involved in severe Mendelian diseases. There's other types of selection, like positive selection or balancing selection, where it's basically the opposite. It's mutations that appear here in blue, all the others are neutral, sorry, not in blue, in red, and this mutation will increase in frequency in the population because this mutation confers a selective advantage. Let's say protection against malaria in an endemic region of malaria. So this is what we have been trying to do, is to dissect whether and how natural selection has acted on innate immunity genes. Over the last 10 years, we have been focusing basically on innate immunity receptors or microbial sensors. The idea that you have here, our work summarized in, into this scheme, is in colors you have the type of selection that can go from purifying selection, which means highly constrained, which means essential and non-redundant role. You can see, for example, that among receptors such as the endosomal toll receptors that are mainly involved in the sensing of nucleic acids, particularly from viruses, play essential and non-redundant roles. Whereas there's other genes like TLR5, for example, that appears to, um, to evolve neutrally. We can make some parallelisms between the type and intensity of selection and how these genes are going to be involved in disease. Genes that are evolving under purifying selection are predicted to be involved in severe, rare, mostly pediatric diseases. Proof of concept of that is that, for example, mutations in the TLR3 pathway um, where not only TLR3, but many of the genes involved in the TLR3 pathway have been associated with herpes simplex encephalitis, that, as you know, is a quite devastating pediatric disease. Whereas our studies also can reveal genes or functions that are more redundant, which doesn't mean useless, but just redundant. An example, toll receptor 5. From 20 to 30 percent of the European and Middle Eastern population has a stop mutation in toll receptor 5 that acts in a dominant negative manner which means that we can live relatively happily without TLR5, which means that the function that is fulfilled by TOLA receptor 5, that is mainly the sensing of flagellin from flagellated bacteria, is redundant, and when we don't have TLR5, there's other genes that are taking over. We have more recently extended this um, analysis to basically all genes that we could found to be involved in innate immunity. Around 1,500 genes, that were manually curated and were uh, divided in different modules of innate immunity, going from sensors, adapters, molecules, effector molecules, and others. So the first thing we did was to evaluate at the genome-wide level how innate immunity genes are evolving, if they are evolving under stronger selective pressures than the remainder of the genome. Basically, the first question was, are innate immunity genes evolving under a stronger purifying selection than the remainder of the genome? And the answer is yes. As you can see here, IIG, so innate immunity genes, present a stronger signals of purifying selection than the remainder of the genome. At this point, this does not necessarily mean that innate immunity genes, 
who are indeed more strongly constrained than the remainder of the genome are constrained because of directly immune-related functions. Some of them have pleiotropic functions, and some of them even, like TLR7, for example, are involved in developmental processes such as uh, neuron connections during embryonic life. Having said that, this allows us to identify a group of innate immunity genes um, that are presenting the strongest selective constraints in the human genome, and again, proof of concept that we are identifying genes mutations in which are involved in severe disorders, or is that mutations in TRAF3 and STAT1 has been involved in, again, severe diseases such as not only herpes simplex encephalitis, but Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial diseases and others. So the idea being that mutations in highly constrained genes are likely to predispose to life-threatening disease. So the second question here was, to which extent innate immunity genes are evolving adaptively? That means to which extent positive selection targets mutations in particular innate immunity genes that have been beneficial in one population but not the other. So this allows us to identify a number of genes in different populations where mut particular mutations have conferred a selective advantage here in Africans, here in European populations, and here in um, Asian populations. So our approach that scanned the genome basically mutation by mutation allow us not only to say, well, CD36 have been targeted by positive selection in Africans, but allow us to trace which is the most likely mutation that is the causal mutation responsible for the signal of selection. As here you can see, for example, for a strong signal of selection identify in the TLR1610 cluster, where we could identify the most likely functional mutation. Also proof of concept that we are identifying genes that have, are relevant in terms of phenotypic diversity is that around half of these genes have already been associated with complex susceptibility in this case and not Mendelian uh, causality almost to inflammation and autoimmune disorders. The next question is, since we have all these mutations here in these genes, that have conferred selective advantage to each of these populations. Can we date the time at, we, at which selection mostly occur? And the answer is that using a Bayesian method, we could date that in most cases, these mutations have been under a strong positive selection in between 6,000 to 13,000 years ago, which is the period at which populations started to shift from a nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle to an agricultural um, sedentary uh, lifestyle, with all the consequences we all know about demography and cohabitation with domesticated animals, and how this modified the um, human exposure to pathogens. So the last question we address here was to which extent, sorry, proof of concept that we are um, identifying also genes targeted by positive selection that have a medical relevance is this example in type 3 interference. Here we identify eight mutations in these three groups. Now there are four type 3 interference or interferon la uh, lambdas. And uh, actually, more or less at the same time, there was other, another different groups that show that these mutations here in interleukin 28b are associated with higher protection Basically, basically a spontaneous uh, viral clearance of HCV infection and a better respond to treatment. So kind of providing proof of concept that the muta specific mutations we are identifying might have a functional relevance. In some cases, adaptation is not necessarily good because environmental pressures change. And mutations that can be adaptive, therefore good at some time, can become maladaptive. And this is something we proposed several years ago by showing that uh, basically these are, for each disease you have here, you have all mutations that have been associated with susceptibility to this disease. And from this line above, you have not only that these mutations, for example, here are associated with susceptibility to celiac disease, 
but these mutations confer a selective advantage, present a signature of positive selection. So the logic is that mutations that are associated with these diseases and present signatures here of positive selection should be mutations that protect against these diseases. But the answer is that in most cases we, we found the opposite. We found that the same mutations that we predict being advantages, therefore under positive selection, the same mutations increase the risk to develop the disease. So the answer to explain that, that can seem counterintuitive, is given in the names of the diseases where you find red things here. That all of them basically are autoimmune or inflammatory diseases, supporting the notion that our immune system has been boosted over our evolutionary history to be quite, quite reactive against infection, but then the same mutations that activate our immune system can also be involved in inflammation and autoimmunity. And this has been confirmed by other people and has been particularly nicely shown in the case of a celiac disease where the same mutations that appear to confer risk to celiac disease uh, are um, protective factors against a bacterial infection. So one of the things that is kind of more an anthropological question that we wanted to also apply in our studies is that to which extent, extent Neanderthals have contributed to us with immune variation. We know from the basis of ancient DNA data that, uh, that Europeans and Asians around from four to six percent of our genomes comes from admixture with Neanderthal. But of course this four to six percent is just an average across the genome. And there is several studies that have scanned our genomes of Europeans or Asians and they have found that we have some regions of the genome where Neanderthal ancestry can go up to 67 percent. So what we wanted to do here is to which extent Neanderthal ancestry has influenced innate immunity. So the first thing we found is that both in Europeans and in Asians, innate immunity genes present a higher degree of Neanderthal ancestry than the remainder of the genome. We could identify around 80 genes in Europeans and around the same not overlapping with Asians, that among the genes that present the highest introgression scores uh, of Neanderthal ancestry that are involved in innate immunity. Some of them have been previously reported, like the OIS cluster that is involved in antiviral immunity. But we could identify strong hits uh, that present very high Neanderthal ancestry, like the TLR1610 cluster, some type 1 interference, and the genes, the, the, the protein family, if it's 1 to 3, that have been involved in antiviral, particularly anti-influenza. Um, responses. So all these are basically just molecular signatures, genetic signatures of natural selection. So the next obvious question is what is the impact of all this on phenotypes? Best case scenario on organismal phenotypes. Why we are shorter, taller, why we are more susceptible to a given disease. But for that we have to start with more simple phenotypes and molecular phenotypes. So this is our model, molecular phenotypes, that means expression in this case. And as I was telling you before, we are trying to understand first the genetic determinants of variation in immune responses. So for that we do EQTL mapping, which means expression quantitative trait loci mapping, in order to pinpoint mutations that are involved in the regulation of gene expression in cysts, like here, like for example just a mutation in a promoter region that alters a transcription factor binding site, or mutations that affect gene expression in trans, so indirectly. Particularly we're interested in what's called interaction QTLs or response QTLs, which means what? This is just an EQTL, where you can see here that the genotype affects the expression of a given gene. But we're interested in cases like that, where the genotype does not affect the expression of the gene at the basal state, 
but the same genotype will affect the expression of the gene, for example, after infection. You can do interaction EQTLs or response EQTL with drugs, with UV treatments. Basically to enlighten a bit all what's related to genotype by environment interactions. So that's why several years ago we started this project in which we recruited 200 people, 100 African and 100 Europeans, all living in Belgium to try to kind of homogenize the, the environmental exposure from which we purify monocytes, again as a model of a major innate immunity cell type. And for each individual, monocytes were treated with five different conditions. That means nothing, rest in monocytes for six hours. And also we activated TLR4 pathway with LPS, TLR1-2 with PAN3, these two pathways being mostly antibacterial um, pathways. TLR7-8 with R848, which is basically involved in antiviral responses, and also as a model of a viral infection, we use a, a whole bug, that means um, influenza. So then we, we sequence by RNA sequencing all these uh, mRNA and microRNA profiles, and we combine these expression profiles both at the steady state and after immunostimulation with the genetic data from these individuals that were characterized by whole genome genotyping and whole exome sequencing to do EQTL mapping. So from an expression point of view, the first thing we observe here, the color code reflects the different conditions uh, basically, gray means non-stimulated. All these different colors here is the TLR1, 2, and 4 responses, TLR7, 8, and here you can see flu. And the shadows, I mean, the different intensity of the colors means the population. The, the lighter Europeans, the darker Africans. So you can see that the first principal component that explains 45% of the variance in gene expression is mainly uh, due to antiviral, anti-flu responses. And the second principal component mainly is due to the activation of the different TLR pathways. We could activate also, we could um, identify co-expression modules, that means groups of genes that shows the same behavior after a given condition, like this one, for example, is a group of around 1,000 genes that are specifically upregulated uh, up and flu infection. So the next question here was how all this diversity is or not under genetic control. So for that, we did EQTL mapping. So in the monocytes, we had around 12,000 genes that are expressed, and uh, we had around 10 million uh, mutations, SNPs, due to our um, following our genetic characterization of the population. So we found that around half of the genes, around 6,000 genes, are associated with an EQTL in cis. That means that around half of the genes that are expressed in monocytes are under control of a nearby mutation. In some cases, the control of gene expression, as you can see here, is kind of universal, whatever the condition you are using and whatever the, popul the, the population you are looking at. But we found 2,000 genes that harbor a response EQTL. Again, mutations that have no effect at the steady state, but have an effect just upon stimulation, like here, for example, influenza infection. In 75% in of the cases, response EQTL are condition-specific, just observed upon TLR4 activation or flu or TLR7-8 highlighting the high context specificity of genotype by infection or by environment interactions in this case. So then we map also master regulators of gene expression, which means mutations that act in trans. A given mutation will be associated with the expression of many or a large number of genes physically independent. So in most, study, most studies are underpowered, to detect trans EQTL because you need lots of people and lots of RNA sex and lots of money. So what you are basically what we are basically here identify are very strong master regulators. We identify around 40 
and two were very strong, one in interferon beta-1 and the other in TLR1. So again here, we come to one of the genes we studied in the past for other reasons, because one mutation in TLR1 is associated with ex the expression of around 100 genes. So this mutation, we knew it already, because this mutation is associated with a drastic reduction in NF-kappa-B activity and is very differentially distributed between Africans and Europeans. It's basically absent in Africans and present at around 30% in Europeans. This mutation is responsible for the decrease in gene expression of all this network, where basically is decreasing the inflammatory response. And also this mutation is showing one of the strongest signatures of positive selection between Africans and Europeans, suggesting that to this mutation, the decrease in the inflammatory response in Europeans has conferred a selective advantage. We found also other kind of signals related to reduced inflammation and how reduced inflammation has conferred a strong selective advantage, not only in Europeans here, but in Africans through other independent mechanisms. We found in general that positive selection has targeted immunity-related expression quantitative trail loci. That means that regulatory mutations associated with immune responses have been privileged targets of positive selection and that have contributed basically to differentiating further immune responses between, in our case here, Europeans and Africans. And also we found by correlating the mutations we identify as associated with differential immune responses and the previous analysis with it of Neanderthal ancestry all along the genome, that Neanderthals have preferentially introduced in the genomes of Europeans mutations that are involved in antiviral responses. So to finish, I will end with, I kind of change a bit now, to some studies we have done on epigenomic variation that will relate also with immune responses. So basically, as you know, there's many different types of epigenetic markers, and the one we have been studying is uh, the DNA methylation. The dogma more or less say that basically, to make it short, when you have a promoter region that is not methylated, the gene will be mostly expressed, and when the promoter region here is methylated, the, uh, the gene uh, won't be expressed. So our interest here is that since we're interested in transcriptional differences between populations, we're also, and we have been looking how genetics influence transcriptional difference between populations, how other factors also may be involved in transcriptional differences between populations. So there's different factors that affect DNA methylation. Of course, environmental factors, such as nutrition, toxic pollutants, even social environment. But a substantial portion of DNA methylation patterns is inherited because they are under the control of DNA sequence variation. And again, as we have been seeing for transcription, these are methylation quantitative trade loci a mutation that is associated with different patterns of DNA methylation, therefore inherited. Again, uh, there's a complex role of the, the role of DNA methylation if it's active or passive in gene regulation. So actually we knew very little about how populations, healthy populations in the natural setting like us, vary in terms of DNA methylation profiles, because there has been just three studies that have been comparing basic 1,000 genomes uh, populations, cosmopolitan, like Europeans, Africans, and Asians. Moreover, and that's kind of more serious, all these studies have, have assessed the patterns of DNA methylation in lymphoblastoid cell lines, where, by definition, DNA methylation can be substantially altered. So the question we wanted to address here was, which are the relative impacts on, of genetic variation, on the one hand, on DNA methylation variation, but also of variation in lifestyle and mode of subsistence of populations. So to do so, we use our kind of favorite model, that is Central Africa, 
and Central African populations. And why? Because we have a huge variation in terms of cultural diversity, habitat diversity, biodiversity in general. And we have been studying over the last 15 years, I would say, two groups of populations, rainforest hunter-gatherers, that are sometimes known as pygmy populations. They live in the forest and they bait their mode of subsistence in hunting and gathering. And then we have agriculturalists that are, well, basically population like us, that their subsistence is based on agriculture and their current habitat is either, either urban areas or rural areas. We know very well the genetic history of these populations, where they separate, whether they have admixed it or not, and basically the demographic history of these populations in terms of bottlenecks on the one hand, the pygmies, and a strong expansions in the other side, on the other hand, the Bantu-speaking populations. But here, what we did care was about their patterns of DNA methylation. So for that, we have to do, to do a kind of triangle of comparison because there were many, many confounding factors in this study. And actually what we compare was first two groups of agriculturalists. Why? Because they have the same mode of subsistence, agriculture, and they have basically the same genetics. And the only thing that distinguished these two groups is where they live. This lives in urban or rural areas and this lives in forest. So in this case, if there are some differences from a DNA methylation point of view, they should reflect recent differences in um, recent differentially methylated sites, because this transition has been quite recent. Whereas the other comparison was to compare the hunter-gatherers and the farmers that have different historical mode of subsistence by definition, farmers and hunter-gathering, different genetics, we know that, but we homogenize the environment. They all live in the forest. So should there be any differences in terms of the differentially methylated site should reflect in that case historical differences between being a, a pygmy basic hunter-gatherer and being a Bantu-speaking farmer. So here you have the results of principal component analysis of DNA methylation variation. And here you have the ones that should reflect recent differences in habitat. And these are the ones that should reflect historical differences between pygmies and bantus, because here the environment is the same. So from a quantitative point of view, we found almost the same impact on DNA methylation. Around 5,000 differentially methylated sites here, and here around 4,000 differentially methylated sites, showing that regardless of the differences, recent or historical, between this population, the impact on DNA methylation profiles is almost the same. But when we look who are the genes that are involved here and who are the genes that are involved here, we found that in terms of biological functions affected, there's a strong differences. Whereas recent differences in habitat mainly affect immune-related processes, the historical differences distinguishing pygmy hunter-gatherers and farmer will mainly be uh, related to developmental processes. So the next question is, are these differences in DNA methylation under genetic control, yes or no? So the, uh, the answer that is quite logical is yes for historical differences. No, depleted the DNA methylation differences due to recent differences in habitat, that means the transition from forest-based environments towards urban and rural areas is depleted in genetic control, whereas the historical differences that distinguish hunter-gatherers and farmers are enriched in genetic control. Examples of genes whose patterns of DNA methylation differ between hunter-gatherers and farmers and are under genetic control are genes involved, for example, in height or in bone mineral density, phenotypes that are obviously unknown to be different between the two populations. So this, in general, what this kind of support a model that has been previously suggested, a step in stand model of response slash adaptation in which when there is an environmental change, we will tend to use our epigenetic system to rapidly respond to the environment and couple 
these differences in DNA methylation from any difference in DNA sequence variation in a way of kind of waste time until a real mutation, mutation here being a change in DNA sequence variation will come and will eventually fix the adaptive phenotype. So to finish, just to tell you a bit um, where are we going, we are keep on studying um, genome diversity at the population level, working with populations that have different lifestyle and different environment and in which we are characterizing their genetic and epigenetic profiles to try to understand the phenotype that we are mostly interested in, that is immune response variation. Immune response variation, as the example I gave you in terms of molecular phenotypes, such as gene expression, but also gene expression of microRNAs and how microRNAs controls also the, um, uh, the differences in immune responses, cellular phenotypes, that means population heterogeneity in terms of different immune cell types and eventually organismal phenotypes. So with this, I would like to, to thank the, the people in my lab that have been the main actors of, of the work. Of these three pieces of recent work I have been showing you, our collaborators within and outside France and the funding agencies. Thank you.